Welcome to our study in the book of Galatians, lesson 16 this evening. We are getting close to coming to the end of chapter 5, but uh, we're not going to finish chapter 5 this evening. It's a little bit shorter lesson because I wanted to, uh, I don't want to, the last part of Galatians chapter 5 deals with the fruit of the Spirit, and I didn't want to start it and uh, not finish it. So, uh, I have titled this portion of the lesson, False doctrine produces carnality, and I'll and I'll and I'll prove prove it to you from the scriptures here in a moment. Uh, I, I mentioned this before, and I mention it again. You've heard me say it many times. I grew up in a church that was filled with false doctrine. Uh, they didn't know their Bibles really well, and they had these weird uh, doctrines that took me uh, years to dispel and dismiss and and uh, get my head wrapped around what true doctrine is. Now I'm not saying they were not saved; they were. But uh, one thing I noted when I was growing up in, in the church, in the church that I grew up, there was a lot of fighting, a lot of divisions, a lot of strife. And uh, it, it, it exactly fits what the Bible tells us will happen. So, and I can tell you from experience, not only from my experience, but from the Word of God tells you, when false doctrine enters a church, there is the result, or the byproduct if you want to call it, is carnality. Uh, what is a carnal Christian? A carnal Christian is someone who lives to please the flesh rather than pleasing and honoring God. Uh, if you want a, a perfect example of that, uh, for example, um, we have Wednesday night Bible studies here. And uh, most people on Wednesday night choose to sit down and watch their favorite TV show than go to Bible study. Or they would rather go fishing than go to church. Uh, they would rather... Uh, go shopping, then pray and, or read the Bible. That's a carnal Christian. They don't really care or the things of God have not become a priority in their lives. A carnal Christian is a Christian who has accepted the gift of salvation. They are saved, but they have not allowed the Holy Spirit to begin the work of sanctification in their lives. Um, the desire of the Holy Spirit is to transform the inner man and to make you more like Christ. And I don't want you to forget this. If you believe right, you act right. If you believe wrong, you act wrong. Uh, that, did I say that right? If you believe right, you act right. If you believe wrong, you act wrong. Uh, I have learned that from experience and from the Bible. So let's begin with this short introduction uh, in chapter 5 of Galatians, verse 13. And I want you to, as I'm reading these verses, see how what I've told you in the introduction, how it fits in with these verses. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, what was, before I read verse 14 15, I want to bring back to your memory. What was the main issue with the church of Galatia? What was the main issue that Paul was writing to address in this epistle? They went back to the law. They went back to the law. They were, uh, they had become legalists. They, uh, fall into the trap that you have to do the law to please God or to maintain or your righteousness. Verse 14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But, notice verse 15, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So now in this section, Paul will present the Galatians with the difference between liberty under grace and the law. Paul has made it clear that uh, we are no longer obligated or bound to the law. That means we don't have to go through all the ceremonies, all the sacrifices, and all the sanctification, the, the cleansing rituals that are found in the law. We don't have to do these anymore. Uh, Jesus Christ came to free us from these things, to free us from the law. But because Christ has freed us from the law, it does not mean that we don't have any standards. It does not mean that we don't uh, control our flesh, that we don't uh, have boundaries. Uh, someone says, why do you put a fence around your home? To keep your children safe. Why do you think God tells us, don't do this or don't do that? Why does God put boundaries around us? Because he, does, he wants us not to have fun. To protect us, to protect us. But very few people realize that. You've heard the saying, if it feels good, do it. Uh, that is completely against scriptures now the truth is that we are still in the flesh and as christians if you're in the flesh guess what's going to happen every once in a while you're going to 
do what the flesh tells you, and you're going to make a mess of things. But in Christianity, we have liberty. But this liberty presents us with a minefield that is just because you have liberty, it doesn't mean you have to give your flesh a green light to do whatever it wants. Does that make sense? Uh, I technically, now I'm going to get into hot water, I'm going to get into trouble by saying this. Technically, if you're saved, you really don't have to do anything. You really don't. You don't have to do one good work because salvation is by faith in Christ alone. Any good works that you do after salvation add nothing to your salvation. They take away nothing from your salvation. I do works after I'm saved because I realize that that's what God wants me to do and because I love Him. Do you understand how that works? Uh, so if you see a Christian and he's not living for God and he doesn't care about living for God, and we see many of these Christians today, does that mean they lose their salvation? No, they're eternally secure because the eternal security in the dispensation of grace is provided by the sealing of the Holy Spirit. It rubs many Christians the wrong way when you say a Christian has the liberty to live in sin. Technically, he does. But should they? See, that's the question. No. Just because you have liberty and you can do whatever you please, it doesn't mean you should. Now, if you're a child of God and you sin and you live like the world, guess what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit's going to convict you. God is not going to let you get away with it. Even though you can, He will not let you get away with it. The Holy Spirit will convict you. And eventually, if you keep going on that path, being a, being a, a son of God, you will be chastened by the Lord Himself. So, can you hear me in that? No, I think I unmuted myself. Okay. So, uh, I don't know why some people choose to call this late, but uh, don't they know we have Bible study? They should be attending Bible study instead of calling, but anyways. So, when you sin, the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sin, and God will chasten you if you go down the wrong path. Uh, the Christian, according to Scripture, technically has the choice to make. As a Christian, you have two choices to make. <clears throat> you can either use this liberty that you have to uh, serve Christ free from the burden of the law or you can serve the flesh that's the two choices you have but you also have to know and Paul alludes to this in verse 14 that when you sin and live after the flesh guess what's going to happen along the way you're going to hurt someone you're going to hurt someone uh, Sin doesn't produce isolated casualties. When you sin, you don't only affect yourself. Someone around you will get hurt because of your sin. A drunk driver will eventually cause a fatality. A cheating spouse will eventually can destroy his or her family. A lying politician will kill thousands. And we've seen that in the last few years. Many of you know exactly what, I, what I'm talking about. A pervert will ruin many innocents. A liberal teacher will affect how the next generation thinks. Uh, your sin is not isolated to yourself. In Romans 14, 7, the Bible says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. So if you choose the path of sin, people around you are going to get hurt. And you will not get away with your sin. You may think you're getting away with your sin, but you won't. You've heard this expression that says, Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. That's the problem with sin. As Christians, we have been free and we have the power to escape the, the bondage of self-righteousness and we also have the power to escape the bondage of sin. So as a Christian, God has called me and you to live a holy life and to serve Him and to serve others. And our motive should be what? love in verse 15 paul lets us in on another problem that was going on in the church of galatia he tells us that they were fighting amongst themselves they were arguing they were devouring one another in a modern vernacular we would say dog eat dog this is, this is a dog eat dog world now who do the galatians sound like if you look at your notes you'll be cheating but who did the Church of the Galatians sound like? 
Israel. Israel, yes, okay. But in the New Testament, let me be more specific. What other church sounds similar to the Galatians? Remember what he says to them here in verse, uh, verse 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Anybody? The Corinthians, the Corinthians. This sounds like the Corinthians. And what does Paul call the Corinthians? Carnal. 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 You see that? Uh, uh, a evidence of carnality is strife, arguing, fighting. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. You see that? No divisions among you. But that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For it, hath, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Do you see that? Contentions. Uh, verse uh, chapter 3, verse 3 of the same uh, book. For ye are yet carnal, for as there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Carnal Christians will always be arguing, striving, quarreling, fighting, arguing, because they can't control their spirit, they can't control their flesh, they can't control their emotions, they cannot control their thoughts, because they have not completely yielded over to the Holy Spirit. A house that is full of arguing and fighting is not governed or controlled by the Holy Spirit. Paul gives us, Paul though, he, I'm glad he does this, he gives us the antidote for living after the flesh. He says, it, you, you, if you are busy serving others in love, then you will not have time to serve the flesh. The problem with the flesh, it's, it wants its lusts to be fulfilled. And it doesn't care about others. Have you ever met people who really don't care about other people, about their feelings, about their thoughts? They're, they're, the reason why they're that way is because they're always serving their flesh. They have no desire to serve others through love. It is only this way, Paul says, that we can subjugate the flesh. You can, you're, when you're busy serving God, you won't have time to fulfill the lust of the flesh. I remember, I remember when I was younger... But one of the things that helped me stay out of trouble was I was always busy serving God. Wednesday nights, I was in church. Saturday, when the soul wedding, I was there. Sunday morning, I was in Sunday school. Sunday morning, I was in church. Sunday night, I was in church. And uh, I was busy with the things of God. And the times in my life where I wasn't busy with the things of God are the times where I got in trouble. But what does that say? Uh, uh, an idle mind is the devil's playground, playground or, work or, or workshop. That expression has many different variations when we get busy serving others we will have no time for the flesh it's like we're, we are saying to the flesh i am busy right now i don't have time for you or your nonsense i want to serve god i want to please god and this is the life that our lord jesus christ himself lived and he is a person who had more liberty than anyone anyone who walked the face of this earth in mark 10 45 he says for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Paul, Christ's love is one of service. Uh, Christ's life is one of service, motivated by his love for his creation. And Paul, it's as if Paul is addressing the legalists, and he's telling them, uh, you want to keep the law? Then love one another. Love your neighbor. Because in Matthew 22, verse 35 through 40, Jesus makes it clear the law is basically can be broken out into two basic commandments. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So as a Christian, do you love God? If you love God, you'll obey Him. Uh, do you love your neighbor? If you love your neighbor, guess what you will do to your neighbor? You will do good to him. You will not harm him. And the reason why we have so much crime and so much mess in our country today is because people do not love their neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to take his wife. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal his car. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to abuse his children. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to take his property. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to uh, 
bear false witness against them, and on and on and on we can go. When you live life devoid of loving others, you're basically living like a wild animal. What do wild animals do? They bite and devour one another. Uh, try to take uh, uh, a, a wild animal's food. Try to take it. Not only will he keep his food, he'll take your hand too. A cat, when the cat's eating, try to put, stick, your, stick your hand in a, in a cat's bowl while the cat is eating. See if, you're gonna, if you can pull your, your hand out unscathed. If you want to see fireworks, place two selfish people together and have them live together. They will eventually consume each other. What you have there is two carnal people. Whenever you see fighting and contention, it is carnality, my friends, because the Holy Spirit does not motivate us to fight, to bite, to devour, to consume one another. And when you find yourself quarreling, you have to ask yourself, am I being controlled by the Holy Spirit this time? Or am I being controlled by my flesh? What does the flesh want? Me, myself, and I. Right? That's it at once. And if he can't have his own way, the flesh is going to argue. He's going to fight like a wild animal. If you try and take away its food. And now Paul, in the next section, he, uh, and which is going to be the uh, second half of our lesson this evening, Paul talks about the works of the flesh. So let's go back to chapter 5, and we're going to pick up in verse 16. <clears throat> this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now Paul breaks it down so all of us can understand it. If you walk in the Spirit, you are not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. How many of us find ourselves into this situation? We don't do the things that we want to do. is because this flesh is fighting us. The laziness uh, uh, is, one of the, is, is the flesh. Have you ever thought about that? Laziness is the flesh. It keeps you from doing things that you ought to do. Verse 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Oh, that's not me. Well, the list goes on. You're going to find yourself in this list. Verse 20, Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before as as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Just recently, uh, earlier in, during this lesson, we had mentioned that a Christian has two choices. The choices that you have as a Christian is that you either can walk in the Spirit or you walk in the flesh. At any given time, right now, at any given time, you're either walking in the flesh or walking in the Spirit. There is no other path that you can take. Yes, sir. Verse 17, what does um, like lust of mean there? Desires, the lusts against the spirit. Uh, it fights the spirit to fulfill its own desires. Uh, for example, let's say you're hungry. And your flesh will make you want to steal to fulfill that hunger. And the spirit says... And it's wrong. You'd rather go hungry than steal. But the flesh says, I don't care. I'm, I'm hungry. I'm going to steal. That's what it means. The flesh is always going to lust against the spirit. Um, so, <clears throat> the Christian has two natures, which are contrary one to another. The Christian has two choices. That is, a Christian can walk in the spirit, or the Christian can walk in the flesh. And this is driven because we have two natures. We have the old flesh that's still alive. Even though you're saved, you still carry this body. Someone said, now this is not, you've got to be careful with this. Someone said you're two-thirds saved. When you get born again, you're two-thirds saved. Your soul and your spirit are saved, but your flesh does not get saved. <clears throat> when does your flesh get saved? <clears throat> Excuse me. When? At the rapture, when you get a new body. Your flesh is, is still sinful. Uh, for some reason, God allowed us to live on the earth. Uh, he 
at the moment of our salvation, God could have taken us home, but he decided to leave us here because he has a job for us to do. So the Christian, what was that? Yes, the Christian has two natures, and these natures are fighting each other. They are contrary one to another. Uh, each nature prevents the other from doing what it wants. The flesh keeps the spirit from doing what it wants, and the spirit can keep the flesh from doing what it wants. And Paul sums it up neatly in Romans chapter 7, verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. The thing that I want to do, Paul says, I don't do it. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. You know, you have to unpack this a little bit. Paul's saying, I always, I always find myself doing the things that I want to do. But the Holy Spirit desires what the flesh abhors. And the flesh desires what the Holy Spirit abhors. That's what it means to be contrary. In the next few verses that we just read, we're going to look at, Paul gives us a list of what the flesh does and what the Spirit does. And we're not going to look at the fruit of the Spirit this, this evening. I want to leave that for next week. But one preacher said, most Christians spend a lifetime running errands for a corpse. Does that make sense to you? They spend their lives running errands for a corpse. The corpse is this flesh here. Yes, you have to take care of it to some extent, but don't let it run your life. The only remedy to fight the flesh is to walk in the Spirit. You can tell when someone is walking in the Spirit because what will you see in them? You'll see the character of Christ in them. They'll talk like Jesus. They will look more like Jesus. And they will behave a lot like Jesus. You can always tell when someone is walking in the flesh and someone is walking in the Spirit. And Jesus himself said that the mission of the Holy Spirit is to promote and to speak of him. And I give you here the references in this, in this handout. So when you hear people overemphasize the work of the Holy Spirit, is that scriptural? When you emphasize the Holy Spirit, is that scriptural? Why? What is the Holy Spirit's job? To point you to Christ and to make you more like Christ. The Holy Spirit's job is not to bring glory unto himself, even though he's God, but his job is to bring glory unto the Son. And when the Christian walks in the Spirit, he listens to what the Holy Spirit says, and he does what the Holy Spirit says, and he allows himself to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's desire and job is transform you and me into the image, the very image of Christ. The problem is when you disobey the voice of the Holy Spirit once, then it's easier for you to do it the second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. And eventually what the Bible says becomes as you have seared your conscience, and you no longer listen to the Holy Spirit. There is no way you can fulfill the lusts of the flesh if you walk in the Spirit. And likewise, when you are fulfilling the lusts of the flesh, guess what? You cannot walk in the Spirit. It is hard to walk in the Spirit because these two uh, natures are fighting each other. And when you walk in the Spirit, you naturally become free from the law. You're focused, you focus your attention on fulfilling the will of God in your life. And as you are fulfilling the will of God in your life, you're not concerned about whether you're doing the law or not. Why? When you're focused on fulfilling the will of God in your life, you are not focused on keeping the law. Why? That's right, because in trying to do what God wants you to do and fulfilling God's will in your life, you'll end up keeping the law naturally. See how that works? When you are flying, when you can fly, do you worry about gravity? No. When you can breathe underwater, do you worry about drowning? If you're made out of steel, you don't worry about <coughs> cutting yourself. Why? Because you don't. So when you're keeping or walking in the Spirit and, and are in the center of God's will, you don't worry about keeping the law because it naturally happens. It's part of fulfilling the, fulfilling the will of God. Walking in the Spirit is the key, but walking in the Spirit is not easy. Why? Because the flesh will fight you tooth and nail. Many of you have heard the story about 
the Indian chief and the two dogs. Uh, many of us since becoming Christians have heard the story of the two dogs and it makes a lot of sense. The story goes that an old Indian chief of an American Indian tribe had just come to faith in Jesus Christ and because of this, his tribe was paid regular visits by an early American preacher. As the preacher continued to make his visits to the tribe, he continued to disciple the chief regarding his new faith. One day, as the preacher came to visit, he asked the Indian, Well, chief, how's it going? The chief replied, It's like there are two dogs always fighting inside me. There's a white dog and a black dog. And the preacher asked, Well, which dog is winning? The chief replied, The one I feed the most. You cannot have a better illustration uh, regarding the battle between the flesh and the spirit than this, two, than this fight. And how do you feed the, the spirit? How do you feed the Spirit? By doing, things of the Spirit? By doing things of the Spirit. The Spirit requires food. Do you know that? Do you know that your Spirit requires food? And what is the main food source of the Spirit? The Bible. The Bible. That's why the Bible is so important. It's called the bread of life. If you spend time in the book, you will feed your Spirit. And that's why people say, well, uh, the Bible is, I can't read. Well, you have to feed your Spirit. You know, uh, when your kid was little, you stuffed the broccoli and the green beans. You didn't care if the kid didn't like it. You said, it's good for you. You need to eat the green beans and the broccoli. They like to eat the banana and the, and the strawberries and the peaches and, and whatever else, but they didn't like the, the, veg, the veggies. Sometimes the Bible is like that. It's like eating your veggies. You have to eat your veggies because you need them. They're good for you. You read the Bible because you need to, not because you feel like it. If you... If you based everything on your feelings, nothing would happen. There's a battle going inside you, O oh Christian, and this battle is between your flesh and the spirit. Even though your old man was crucified in the flesh and is dead in Christ, he still has power to influence you. And that's why Paul says, I die daily. The flesh has to be crucified on a daily basis. Positionally, yes, it was crucified once on the cross with Christ, but practically, you have to kill the flesh every day. You have to, I mean, sometimes you look at your flesh and you're like, those of us who are getting older and are more mature as Christians, uh, we can't wait to get rid of this flesh. I don't understand Christians who want to live on this, on, this, on this planet. Now, I've got a family, I've got kids, I've got responsibilities. Don't get me wrong. Like I had a pastor used to say, I want to go to heaven, but I'm not going to take the next bus. I would take the next bus if I could, if the Lord would allow me. But I still have responsibilities here, and I want to stay alive for my wife and for my kids and for, for our church people. So, and that's why Paul said, for me to die is gain, but to live is Christ. And Paul says, I am in a strait between two. I, 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 I don't know what to do, Paul says. I really want to go to heaven, but I know I, I need to stay behind for your sakes. And that's how we should be as Christians. We should look forward to heaven. But we know we have responsibilities. And we love the, the, uh, our loved ones. And we want to take care of them. So we want to stay behind for their sakes. And that's how our attitude should be. I want to go to heaven, but I know if I do go to heaven, my kids are still young, my wife uh, still needs me, and I still have uh, people to, to take care of. Martin Luther said, When the flesh begins to cut up, the only remedy is to take the sword of the Spirit, the word of salvation, and fight against the flesh. If you set the word out of sight, you are helpless. Notice what he says. If you set the word out of sight, you are helpless against the flesh. I know this to be a fact. I have been assailed by many violent passions, but as soon as I took hold of some scripture passage, my temptations left me. Without the word, I could not have helped myself against the flesh. And try this out for your life. The more time you spend in the word of God, the stronger your spirit is because you're feeding it. It's like the white dog. Give the white dog the steak. Uh, don't give the black dog. Starve the black dog. And here in the next last part of our lesson, Paul gives us a list of, uh, of things uh, that are constrained as the works of the flesh. So, let's look at the, these works of the flesh. And they can be divided into four categories. Sexual sins, religious sins, social sins, 
and personal sins. So the first one I want us to look at is adultery. What is adultery? So uh, there's a lot of these words that most Christians have never taken the time to look at the definitions, but we're going to do that this evening. Adultery is when a married person has relations with some other, someone other than their spouse, thus violating the marriage covenant. Now this, now this is this, this particular sin or work of the flesh is missing in the corrupt Greek manuscripts. So if you have a Bible, a modern Bible version, uh, they'll actually flip it around and, and they'll tell you the best, most accurate, uh, pristine Greek manuscripts do not have this word. It's actually the other way around. It's the corrupt manuscripts that do not have this word in there. The next one is fornication. This is relations between people not married to each other. And who uh, Hollywood is a proponent of this. They push it really hard. Uh, and that's what's wrong with the new generation of America. The, the, the young people are busy, busy fornicating. That's a fact. That's a fact. Number three, uncleanness. Impurity. Being dirty, being filthy, being morally and spiritually impure. Uh, this covers many uh, sexual sins that do not actively involve intercourse or even interaction with another person. So we're trying to keep this a little bit uh, um, friendly here. We're not trying to make uh, we're not trying to make it R-rated. The, the last sexual sin is lasciviousness. This is extreme intemperance. That means you can't control yourself. It usually refers to unrestrained sexual desire or behavior. Uh, people living like animals. When an animal goes in heat, uh, the animal can't control itself. That's how people live today. They, they can't control themselves. The next category are religious sins. The first one, and there's only two uh, listed here. The first one is idolatry. It's the worship of idols. It's the worship of a physical object as a god. It means immoderate attachment or devotion to something. Uh, idolatry is not necessarily bowing down before a statue and saying, you are my God. Idolatry is something that has your attention, something that has your heart, something that has your affection. Uh, Paul is very careful to tell us that uh, he, uh, that today in, in, in the modern age, that covetousness is equivalent to idolatry, is akin to idolatry. He tells us this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. And, oh, I don't worship any idols, but you worship money. Sure. I don't worship money. Well, that you live for money. If you, if money runs your life, now, the Bible doesn't say, has good things to say about money also, and bad things to say about money. If money runs your life, then it has become your idol. Now, money is necessary. You, you and I have to pay our bills. We have to put food on the table. We have to take care of our homes, our cars, our, our, our families. God is not against that. In fact, the Bible says, money answereth all things. But the problem is when money becomes your God and money has you and it keeps you from doing the things that God wants you to do and you're always pursuing money, it has become an idol in your life. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. The next uh, religious sin is witchcraft. Witchcraft is when you serve the occultic powers. Uh, you hear many people have made co covenants or they have sold their soul to the devil or they have joined a... a uh, a witchcraft group or Wicca or whatever you call it today. There's so many of them you can't keep up with them anymore. Or they practice magic, they use spells. That is wrong. The Bible is against that. Interestingly enough, uh, the word witchcraft is translated from the Greek word pharmakia or pharmakia. You also find this in Revelation 9.21. So we understand that witchcraft also has to do with the use of illicit drugs. Uh, any kind of drugs, LSD, heroin, marijuana, weed, opiates, cocaine, crack, fentanyl, and the list goes on and on and on. Now, God has given us medicines for our own benefit. It's when you abuse these things and they control you, that's the problem. Now, some Christians take it to the extreme and they say, well, I don't take any, I don't take any medicines like, uh, for example, opiates. Uh, sometimes you need them. You, know, you have to have a doctor's supervision. You can't just go in there and take a bottle of opiates and just take them all. Uh, they say the, the oils in the marijuana plant serve medicinal purposes. 
And a lot of Christians will use that as an excuse to smoke it. Uh, if you smoke marijuana, it's going to mess up your brain. It's a fact. Look it up. Oh, it doesn't, won't hurt me. Uh, it will. Uh, smoke it long enough and you're going to lose some, some gray matter up there. I've, I've, I've seen people with that. Uh, in fact, I'm not going to get into it, but uh, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Uh, fentanyl. There's a fentanyl ep epidemic in our country today. Our politicians are not addressing it. Flowing through our southern border. The Chinese are giving it to the Mexican drug cartels and they're bringing it into the southern border. Have you ever wondered why they don't close the southern border? And when you, take, when you talk about locking down our border, they always accuse you of being what? Anti-Mexican. Anti you hate Mexicans. I've heard that so many times. One of my co-workers uh, brought it up to me. I said, really? I said, uh, I agree that our immigration system is broken, but the fact that we want to secure borders, is, is that good or bad? You tell me. Am, uh, do I hate my neighbors because I locked my front door? Am I anti-neighbor? No. These drugs are flowing freely from our southern border, and then nobody's talking about it. Hundreds of thousands of young people are dying every year. Do we not have a responsibility to these people to help them? Because Anyways. you're tired and you're poor. Yes. Yeah. I came to the, I'm an immigrant. I came to this country from Canada, but I did it legally. I did it legally. There are ven many venues you can come to this country legally. I'm not against immigration. What I'm against is these drug cartels bringing their, their drugs to the southern border and killing our people. Look it up. If I'm saying a lie, call me out on it. Why? They want, they, they want us to be dependent upon drugs. They want our young people to be uh, crackheads and cokeheads because, anyways, I'm going to get off on that. It's, it's a religious sin. When you take drugs, let's go on to the social sins. Hatred, an attitude of the heart which expresses itself as an intense dislike or ill will. Uh, God doesn't want you to hate anyone. There we go again. As a Christian, you have to love everyone. But it doesn't mean you don't call out their sin. So many times as Christians, when we call out people's sin, we get accused of hating them. Isn't, have you ever experienced that? When, when I say uh, homosexuality is a sin... Did that mean, do I, does that mean I hate these people? I can't hate them. I'm supposed to love them. But that does not mean I cannot call out their sin. Does that make sense? As Christians, we have to call out people's sins. The Bible says in the Old Testament, woe unto him. In fact, even Ezekiel, if you know your brother's sinning, you've got to call him out because if you don't, his blood is going to be on your hands. Next one, variance. What is variance? Variance is the state or fact of disagreeing or quarreling. When you're arguing, when you're in the process of arguing, you're at variance. It's translated from the Greek word eris. And eris was the Greek goddess of discord. In fact, the word in the New Testament, the Greek word is eris. Third one, emulation. What is emulation? It's the effort to match or surpass a person or achievement. Typically by imitation. It is the ambition or the endeavor to be better than the next person. Now this does not mean competition. When you're running a race, you want to beat the other guy. But emulation is when you are purposefully trying to be better than that person. Uh, we have some people that they always knock down other people. Why do they knock them down? Because they feel inadequate themselves and they want to be better than that person. And they can't do it. So that, what do they do? They knock them down. That is emulation. Uh, envious rivalry. What is wrath? Anger and hot temper. The Bible says, as Christians, we have to control our temper. Strife. What is strife? Strife is is uh, is arguing, is disagreeing, but because of your position, you're arguing over issues. It's anger or bitter disagreement over fundamental issues. So you're not just arguing, you're arguing over a particular topic, right? Today in our society, we're arguing over abortion, that is strife. We're arguing over immigration, that is strife. We're arguing over government's role in our lives, that is strife. Uh, churches have strife, doctrinal strife. Uh, when I was growing up, there was an uh, argument in, uh, between uh, the nature of Christ. There's a uh, 
there's a false doctrine out there that teaches that when Christ came on earth, he left his deity behind. Monophysites, that's what they're called. There was, when I was growing up, they were arguing all the time. Uh, strife also is cliques forming in the church, and these cliques argue. Uh, what church in the New Testament was known for this? The Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? You see that strife? What was one of the Corinthians' issues? What, what were they fighting over? I am, I am of Paul. I am of Cephas. Remember that? I, I like Paul. I like Peter. I like James. I like John. And Paul said, who died for you? Did Peter die for you? Did Paul die for you? No. Christ died for you. Seditions. What is seditions? Conduct or speech inciting people to rebel against authority. Don't we see that today happening in our, in our day and age? It's wrong, and even in our Constitution, it's wrong to incite people to violence. It's wrong to use speech to incite someone to violence. That is anti-scriptural. And as Christians, we should never run to violence. Never. The last, uh, another one is heresy. What is heresy? Heresy uh, in, in Greek means to choose something. Over time, it came to mean someone who divisively expressed their choices or opinions. Today, when we talk about heresies, we talk about false doctrine. And trust me, there's a lot of false doctrine in Christianity today. There's a lot of isms and schisms. And even the Bible tells us there must be heresies. Why? Why does God allow heresies? Why does God allow them? One, pur one purpose only. Well, there is multiple purposes. But one purpose says, the reason why God allows heresies or false doctrine, so those who have the true doctrine may shine. So you can see those who are, so those who you are supposed to follow. Does that make sense? Now, if I have this, I teach you this. If, if I can poke, and it goes both ways, if I can poke a hole in your doctrine, you have to examine your doctrine. You have to examine it. If I, through the scripture, now I'm not saying through, through argument and through, through uh, what's the word, that, uh, through logic. The only way you can poke a hole through someone else's doctrine is through the scripture. And if, you can, if someone can poke a hole in your doctrine through scripture, you have to sit, sit back and say, well, maybe perhaps I'm believing the wrong thing. The Holy Spirit never led anyone into heresy. What, where does heresy come from? Heresy comes from Satan. The God will not teach you false doctrine that goes contrary to his nature. God's desire is to teach you the truth. Another one we look at now, before we get into the personal sins, is envying. What is envying? It's, uh, it's someone who has, uh, it's different than, than jealousy. Uh, when you say, I'm jealous of God, but when God says, I'm jealous, what does he mean by it? Does that mean he envies us? No, that means he loves us and he doesn't want anyone to get our affection. When you say, I'm jealous of my wife, does that mean you envy her? No, that means you don't want someone else having her attention. So jealous is good. Envy is bad. Envy is when you look at something that someone has or doesn't, you want it. It's, it's very close to covetousness. But it's a feeling that you uh, want to be like that person, but you can't. Another one is murder. What is murder? That's pretty simple. It's the unlawful, premeditated killing of one human being by another. Now, killing someone in self-defense is not murder. The Bible does never... never punishes those who uh, kill someone in self-defense. Now we look at the personal sins. Drunkenness. Drunkenness. While Christians may differ as to if a Christian can drink alcohol or not, the scriptures clearly forbid drunkenness. There's no doubt in the Bible that drunkenness is wrong, it's a sin. We must not think that only being a staggering drunk is a sin. But a sin is also when alcohol takes control over you. The moment, and that goes with everything else. The moment that substance controls you or impairs your thought, it is a sin. No matter what it is. Too much caffeine 
is a sin. Because what happens when you have too much caffeine? You can't control yourself. You, you get the jitters. Is that right? That's wrong. In Ephesians chapter 5, 18, Paul also describes drunkenness as something that is excess, that is too much wine. Getting drunk is a waste. John Trapp writes of drinking, there's three outs, that is, ale out of the pot, money out of the purse, and wit out of the head. I love that. The three outs of drinking. The Holy Spirit never led anyone into drunkenness. You know what the problem with drink is? People can't control it. That's the problem. People can't control it. And if you can't control it, stay away from it. Stay away from it. There is, no, there is no benefit in drinking today in our day and age. We have all the water we need. We have all the soda pop we need. We have all the fancy drinks in the world. There's no need for, for drinking alcohol in today, in today. There's no need for that. Reveling. What is reveling? Reveling is when you enjoy yourself too much. Especially with drinking and dancing. Some people say, oh, the Bible doesn't say anything about dancing. Well, that's what reveling is. It's when you party hard. Even if people say, I play hard and I party hard. Well, God doesn't want you to party hard. Does that mean that God does not want us to have a good time? No. It's when it's excess. You hear people, uh, the music is blasting, they're blaring, they're, they're yelling, kicking, and screaming. Now, that is reveling, my friends. That is reveling. It's participation in a noisy and often drunken celebration. And we notice that Paul concludes this list with and such like, which means there are many other things that Paul could have included, but he did not. Now that Paul has listed the works of the flesh, next, and we're going to look at that next week, he's going to give us the fruit of the Spirit. The difference between the works of the flesh are things that you and I do. And the fruit of the Spirit is something that the Holy Spirit produces in us. You cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit on your own. You can produce the works of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit can only be produced by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at that next week. So any, uh, we're just a tad over, uh, and I did say it was going to be a shorter lesson, so I apologize for not being completely truthful. Uh, that's, uh, that's the flesh. So any questions or comments before we close off? So this last section on drinking, how would you... So I understand what these verses are saying. Yes. And I find that a lot of Christians who, um, you know, we've talked about how the Bible teaches uh, temperance and you can teach abstinence. Yes, you can. Uh, if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, there's a verse, I think it's in Psalms or in Proverbs, that, that says, uh, you know, a, a little bit of wine make the heart merry. Or wine make the heart. So how do you differentiate wine making the heart merry versus somebody, uh, where is the excess? What is the difference between... You don't, you don't I know what you're saying. Sense. I can't answer that because some people cannot handle alcohol at all. Mm -hmm. And some people shouldn't have alcohol at all. They shouldn't. Now, I have to be careful here. If you're going to drink a little, a, a little bit of wine with your meal, is that a sin? Mm -hmm. No. I personally don't drink. But if you want to drink a, a, a glass with your wine, the problem is most people do not drink a little bit of wine. I just find that and it's individual. It's individual. Mm -hmm. And I've heard this from some people. Uh, some people cannot handle alcohol at all. Some people just a sip and it's too much. Right. I know for myself, when I was younger, because Greeks, you know, they drink at the meals. I sneeze. I, when I was a kid, they used to give us some wine. I would sneeze all the time when I would. I don't know why, but I would sneeze. Maybe Nina can answer that question. You made a point saying like... Uh, does that answer your question? No, that's answer yeah, your it question. Does, it does. I can, you cannot define what is excess. Like, for example, food. I look at my daughter. If my daughter ate the way my sons eat, for her, that would be excess. She'd be a glutton. Right? So, everybody's food requirement is different. Wouldn't that cross... Yes, you wanted to say something? Someone told me once, a woman, I drink socially oh, only. Yes. And I told her, just wait. Yeah, those are the social drinkers. How, how many people stay social drinkers? No. Yeah. In the military, I drank scotch. Yeah. And, but I, I never went over. Yes. 
And I knew I had to get back home. Yes. Home to mm -hmm. the barracks. Yes. Um, some of my mates never made it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because never me. Caesar was telling us that when he was in the military, I'm just say for the people that are online, that when he was in the military, he would drink scotch, but he would always make it home. But most of his buddies <laughs> never made it home. Occasionally, I do drink sherry. Yes. And I, as as I did with scotch, I, I don't overdo. Yeah, that's the Bible teaches. I heard one preacher say that the Bible teaches temperance. You know, what temperance is a little bit, and we all all the time people talk about alcohol and cigarettes and this and that, but they forget to talk about food. Yeah. Too much food is a sin. They forget to talk about gluttony, uh, and I mean. God doesn't want us to be overweight. I don't believe God wants us to be overweight because He's given us these bodies and we have to take care of them. You had a question. Is there a difference between drinking and feeling good and drinking and getting drunk? You see, that's subjective. If you drink to feel good, you're in dangerous territory, my people. Right. You're in dangerous territory. Well, and I think that's where the in excess comes in yeah. because if it's controlling you, Okay, now we also have to also then keep in mind, cross that line. you also have to keep in mind that back in the Bible days, now I've heard this argument and I use it myself too, they didn't have clean drinking water. So what they would often do is they would take their water and they would pour some wine in the water. And the water, the wine, was a disinfectant for the water that they were drinking. Kind of like and it's called it. mingled wine. It's in the Bible. We don't have that problem anymore. And poor people would use uh, vinegar. Use yeah, they would, vin they would put vinegar, the yeah. Romans actually had a name for it, and they would give it to their soldiers, and it was part of their ration. It was vinegar and a mix of water. I can't remember the name. Yeah, so there's no need today. Now, I have to be biblical. The Bible says drinking in moderation is not a sin. I have to be biblical. Now, I don't drink. Now, I can't tell someone who has a little bit of wine, I can't tell them they're sinning. I can't do that. Unless because, it's controlling you. Be, unless it's controlling you. Because the Bible allows drinking. Now, if you choose to drink, we say, well, it's your choice. We have liberty in Christ. Now, if you cannot ha handle alcohol, stay away from it. Just like many other things. If you can't handle the cake, like, I have to be honest with you. When I was a kid, I was working out, I was taking martial arts. My dad would bring a cheesecake. And I would eat the whole thing. Now, was that gluttony? Yes. <laughs> but I was active. I was eating so much and I wasn't fat. So would that be gluttony for me? Because I can handle the cheesecake because I was burning so many calories. I was always active. But if I ate that now, today, at my age, yes, it would be gluttony. Because my body doesn't need a whole cheesecake. Yeah, the benefit of youth. <laughs> All right. So good. Yes. Let's end it there. And uh, we'll see you guys next week as we look at the fruit of the Spirit.